as we turn now to war. Three days after President Obama took office, an unmanned U.S. Predator drone fired missiles at houses in Pakistan's administered tribal areas. Twenty-two people were reported killed, including three children. According to a tally by Reuters, the U.S. has carried out 30 such drone attacks on alleged al-Qaeda targets inside Pakistan since last summer, killing some 250 people. The Predator attacks highlight the U.S. military's increased use of unmanned aerial vehicles and other robotic devices on the battlefield. At the start of the Iraq War, the U.S. had only a handful of drones in the air. Today, the U.S. has over 5,300 drones. They've been used in Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia and Yemen, as well as here at home. The Department of Homeland Security uses drones to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border. There's been a similar boom in the use of ground robotics. When U.S. forces went into Iraq in 2003, they had zero robotic units on the ground. Now they have as many as 12,000. Some of the robots are used to dismantle landmines and roadside bombs, but a new generation of robots are designed to be fighting machines. One robot, known as Swords, can operate an M16 rifle and a rocket launcher. A new book has just come out examining how robots will change the ways wars are fought. It's called Wired for War, the Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century. The author, P.W. Singer, joins me here in the firehouse. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, served as coordinator of the Obama campaign's Defense Policy Task Force. He's also the author of Corporate Warriors and Children at War. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. Let's start with Pakistan. Explain what these unmanned drones are. Well, you're talking about systems that can be flown remotely. So the planes, these Predator drones, are taking off from places in, for example, Afghanistan, but the pilots are physically sitting in bases in Nevada. And um, they have incredible capabilities. They can see um, from a great distance. They can stay in the air for 24 hours. And so they're very valuable in going after these um, insurgent and terrorist hide sites, which is in you know, mountainous terrain to be difficult to get U.S. troops in. But the flip side is that um, there's a question of what's the message that we think we are sending with these systems versus the message that's being received on the ground in terms of the broader war of ideas. What do you mean? Well, um, so I spent the last several years going around trying to meet with everyone engaged in this robotics revolution, everything from the scientists behind it to the science fiction authors influencing them to the drone pilots to the four-star generals, but also went out and um, interviewed people in the region. And, um, and this question of uh, messaging, one of the people that I met with was a senior Bush administration official, and he said, the unmanning of war plays to our strength. The thing that scares people is our technology. But that's very different when you go meet with someone, for example, in Lebanon. One of the people that I met with for the book was a um, editor of a leading newspaper there. And he had to say that basically this shows that um, you are cowardly, that you are not man enough to come fight us. So a disconnect between message we think we're sending versus message that's being received. Or another illustration of this would be uh, there was a popular um, music, uh, one of the hit songs in Pakistan last year talked about how the Americans look at us like insects. Shows you how it's permeating pop culture. So you have this balancing act that we're facing between short-term goals and long-term goals. P.W. Singer, the swords, the C-RAM, the PAC-BOT, um, you talk about the robots taking on the three Ds. The three Ds are um, roles that are dull, dirty, or dangerous. And they're basically um, areas where they found robotics have been useful. Um, dull would be, you know, you can't keep your eyes open 30 hours straight. A robot can, so it can monitor empty desert for just in case something happens. Um, dirty is the environment. Uh, it can operate not only in you know, chemical or biological, but also in dust storms or at night. We can't see at night, things like that. And then, of course, dangerous is you can send out a robot to do things that you wouldn't send a soldier to do. Uh, and the sort of joke of it is that you know, when it comes to war, you are the weakest link. Now, the problem is um, what are the implications of that for our democracy? So, for example, if you are sending less and less Americans into harm's way, does it make you more cavalier about the use of force? And one of the people that was fascinating they interviewed was a former assistant secretary of defense for Ronald Reagan, who actually had this to say about these systems. He worried that they would create more marketization of war. As he put it, we might have more shock and awe talk to defray discussion of the true costs of war. But that is a very serious issue when, uh, I mean, 
the time when wars are ended is when one side uh, cannot take the number of casualties that, uh, for example, if your soldiers that are fighting are being killed, but if they're robots. I mean, the concern I have is that it takes certain trends that are already in play in our body politic. Uh, we don't have um, declarations of war anymore. We don't have a draft. We don't buy war bonds anymore. We don't pay higher taxes for war. And now you have the fact that you may be sending more and more machines instead of people. And so you may be taking the already lowering bars to war and dropping them to the ground. And then there's another part of this, of course, is it changes the public's relationship with war. Uh, it's not just that the public is becoming delinked, but remember these machines record everything that they see. And so we have the rise of what I call YouTube war. That is, you can go on YouTube right now and download video clips of combat footage, much of it from these drones. And so in some ways you could say that's a good thing. The home front and the war front are finally connected. You can see what's going on. But we all know this is taking place in sort of our weird, strange world, and these video clips have become a form of entertainment for people. The soldiers call it war porn. P.W. Singer, you write about robots making mistakes, like in South Africa in 2007, a software glitch and a robotic gun in 88, a semi-automatic defense system of the USS Vincennes accidentally shoots down an Iranian passenger plane, killing all 290 people on board, including 66 children. The challenge here is that while we are um, gaining incredible capabilities with these systems, it doesn't end the human mistakes and dilemmas behind them. Another way of putting it is a lot of people are familiar with Moore's Law, the idea that you can pack in more and more computing power uh, such that they double in their power every two years. It's the reason why the um, Pentagon in 1960 had the amount of computing power that you and I can get from a Hallmark card right now. Um, now, Moore's Law is certainly operative. These systems are getting better and better. But Murphy's Law is still in place. And so you get what robot executives call these oops moments with robots when things don't work out the way you want. And it's just like, you know, our laptop computers crash. Well, imagine your laptop computer crashing with an M16 rifle. How does international law address robots in war? Uh, the problem right now is we don't have a good answer to that question. Um, some of the people that I met with for the book were at um, both the International uh, Red Cross and then also at Human Rights Watch. And there's two sort of interesting things that came out of that. At the Red Cross, they basically said there's so much going on in the world that's